ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المحتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدع وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون قال تعالى في القران الكريم وما خلقت الجن والانس الا ليعبدون indeed all praise to Allah we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we ask Allah ta'ala to truly bless this series of lectures that we are doing on the rights in Islam we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase in as in ilm al-nafiyah and amilan mutaqabbilan to accept from us our actions as well so brothers this is a series of very important lectures we're going to have they call the rights in Islam and these rights you can divide them into two there is the rights of al-khaliq the creator and there is the rights of the makhluk the creation two rights and obviously the <coughs> the importance of those rights is determined by what that right who that right is due to and so obviously the right of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most important hukuk the most important rights to fulfill because they concern our creator and as a principle you cannot fulfill the rights of the creation unless you fulfill the rights of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the right of allah comes first and the right of allah ta'ala is to be fulfilled as allah has prescribed it that's why allah has given a clear prescription a clear hukum in terms of how his right is to be fulfilled that's why look at the wisdom of the verse that we often recite ittaqullah haqqa tuqatihi have taqwa of allah allah says orders you to have taqwa how i can decide to have taqwa in the way that i want to do haqqa tuqatihi according to the way that has been prescribed according to the right due to allah this is the way that Allah wants you in the same way Allah says uh, you know wa jahadu fi llahi haqqa jihadihi make jihad how haqqa jihadihi the way that Allah Ta'ala has told you to make jihad not any other way not whatever way you want to do struggle in the way of Allah but the way that Allah has prescribed and that's why the right of Allah comes first because if you do not fulfill the right that which is due to Allah how can you give the due to the creation and likewise in the creation the rights have order as well they have significance based upon what the right is due to so after the right of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes the rights of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the rights of the you know the messenger of allah this is the next and then the rights of the parents of the walidain because of the importance they have in islam so you can see there is a and the right the term the right in english as we know it means something which is due you have to fulfill this requirement you know uh, because this is due upon that which the right is due to if you don't fulfill this right then you have denied someone that right denied that right to what is rightfully due to that person as a result of that you create what you could call zulm oppression and that's why allah ta'ala regarding denial of the right of allah which will explain obviously is shirk in the shirk la zulmun azim this is okay you know the worst wrongdoing the worst of zulm the worst violation and as a result of this violation you create the most fitna and fasad so when you, the, you give the right you create balance you fulfill the right you create not just balance but also justice you know you maintain the mizan but also the justice that comes from fulfilling that right deny the right you create zulm and as a result of zulm you create fasad and fitna upon the creation so let me give you an example of how this works to allah obviously is due there is one of the rights of allah is that allah as the allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is al malik al wahhab al raziq the one who is the owner of all things the one who bestows that which we have been bestowed with the one who is the provider of our risk our provision he has given us our money our mal our wealth for us that wealth that we have 
that which is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the tazkiyah, the purification of that wealth is 2.5% zakah due to Allah ta'ala upon the savings that are saved for 12 months. That is due to Allah. When you've given your due to Allah, okay, then you are allowed, your wealth is purified, you can spend it upon yourself. And you can spend it upon that which is halal upon yourself. If you haven't done that, your money is haram. Because you haven't given the zakat, which is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That zakat is then obviously that, so you fulfilled the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that right of Allah also fulfills the rights in the creation. Because the one who is fakir, the one who is destitute, who cannot meet his basic needs of food, clothing and shelter, if that person is not given wealth by the one who has wealth, so that you redistribute it, zakat is about redistribution, the one who has money gives it to the one who does not have money, then the person who is poor and, and hasn't got money, you've denied that person that uh, the, his haq, which is to receive the zakat. As a result of that, what will that person do? Except that you've made zulm upon that person. And this obviously leads to facade. Obviously, there's no justification for thieving and robbery and stealing. But inevitably, this leads to people who are desperate and destitute. This leads to facade. So can you see how denying the right of Allah, which is zakat, which is due to him. As a result of that, we deny the right of the creation. And denying the right of the creation results in that zulm. And that zulm will create a fitna and the facade, which is upon the grace. So this is why fulfilling the right of Allah, obviously, this not only creates balance, it creates justice, but also is this, this is obviously, uh, and most importantly, this is the reason for which we have been created. And this subject of learning about the rights of Allah and fulfilling the rights of Allah, this is the only reason which, for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Anbiya and the Rasul. This is the most important, uh, 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 like I said, uh, uh, most important fiqh of our religion. This is why the scholars, the Imams of Sunnah, they would call this fiqh al-akbar. The, most, the greatest fiqh, the fiqh of learning how to fulfill the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worship Allah in Tawheed, in His oneness, and not make shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Anbiya and the Rasul, they were sent for this, uh, this reason and no other reason. As Allah mentions in the Quran, وَلَكَدْ بَأَثْنَ فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا عَنِئْبُدُ اللَّهِ وَجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ To every single Ummah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a messenger with the mission with the objective to establish the worship of Allah and the rejection of worship to all of the Taghut. So this is the purpose for which Allah, and that's why from the beginning of, uh, from Adam Alayhi Salaam coming up to the world to Khatib and Nabi'een, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the final messenger, over 124,000 Anbiya and Rusul sent to every single Qawm on the face of this earth. And that's why when you look at the, the, the creation of Allah, you look at the every people, you'll see in some way, shape or form, they have a belief. They believe in some creator, although thereafter, many of these people then have made shirk and they believe and have taken intermediaries or other aliha besides Allah. And okay, we'll come on to explain that. But this goes, this is again, as Allah mentioned, because eventually at some point, a messenger and a rasul was sent amongst these people with this particular belief. And when also, and I'll come on to explain the origins of shirk. How did shirk take place? Shirk it took place after centuries of people worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the veneration, this ghulu, this exaggerated praise of people who are truly awliya sent amongst them, the love of people, and then they ended up eventually becoming the veneration, and then the worship, and then taking them as aliha besides Allah. So the parts of this lecture might get a bit technical, but if you want, you know, just ask me the question and I'll explain this further. So this is why the Anbiya and the Rasul were sent. And this is the most important area of fiqh. As I mentioned, worship Allah haqqa taqatihi. And look at the, what the verse is, the part of that. وَلَا تُمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ And die only in the state of Islam. You fulfill the haqq of Allah, and inevitably that establishes you from the firm foundation of being a Muslim and a Mawahid insha'Allah. And as a result of that, you die as a Muslim. And this is the most important thing. And that's why the importance of, you know, there are many, many branches of fiqh, of uh, what you call religious understanding, many branches. The importance of that branch of fiqh depends on what it is concerned with. And obviously this is why 
The study of the rights of Allah and Tawheed and the Aqeedah is the, is the most important fiqh, is fiqh al-akbar, which takes precedence over all of the other branches of fiqh. Why? Because it concerns the most important subject with which the Anbiya and Rasul were sent with. And, that's what, and, and there are many uh, kind of uh, examples of that. Because La ilaha illallah is the greatest statement that has been made in the history of mankind. Greatest statement. This statement is the difference between Jannah and Jahannam. This is the reason why Allah sent the Anbiya and the Rusul to establish this Aqeedah on the face of this earth. And how the Prophet said, one who says the kalima La ilaha illallah with Iman, with Ikhlas, with Siddiq, with Yaqeen, that Jahannam is haram for that person. Ya Allah, make us of those people. So this is how important it is. And if you look at the seerah, for 13 years in Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ is concerning himself with only one call, one uh, uh, you know, aspect, and that is to call the people to Tawheed, to call them to La ilaha illallah. No other hukum. The Salah was established after the Miraj and you know, towards the latter part of the Meccan period. And so this, uh, this was the sole call of the Prophet ﷺ and the companions in this time in Mecca. Other examples. That when you look at, when the Prophet ﷺ said the greatest ayah in the Qur'an, as we know, is Ayatul Kursi. And this is an ayah which just focuses in nothing other than the Asma wa Sifat of Allah, affirming the names and <coughs> attributes of Allah, and the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greatest surah in the Qur'an, Ummul Kitab, Al-Fatiha. Okay, the opening chapter of the Qur'an, the greatest, the, the, you know, the seven oft recited verses, the greatest surah in the Qur'an, concerning itself with nothing other than Tawheed. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You alone we worship, you alone we ask for help. So again, this is another one of the textual proofs. Surah Al-Ikhlas, equivalent to one third of the Qur'an. If you recite it three times, it is as if you have recited the whole of the Qur'an. It concerns itself with nothing other than Tawheed and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he sent his companions around the, uh, you know, across the world to call the people, okay, Allah ta'ala, he said to his companions, and particularly when he sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu an to Yemen, he said, you are going to the people of the book, so let the first thing you call them to be the Tawheed of Allah. If they learn that, then establish upon them the five prayers, and etc., and, and the rest, and the zakah, and etc., etc. So how the Prophet also made it very clear to Ma'ad, the first thing that you call the people to is to La ilaha illallah. And so this is why when we leave this firm foundation, when we leave Tawheed, when we leave the Kalima and then and, and open the door towards Shirk, this is why the Adhab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes upon us. And today for sure we see the Adhab of Allah upon us. You know, we've spoken about this in lectures in the past. And many of the khutbahs that we've done about, we see this, remind ourselves all the time about the fitna, whether it's in Burma, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in Palestine, whether it's in Pakistan, whether it's in Philippines, whether it's in Afghanistan. We see this and we ask Allah obviously to remove this hardship upon the Muslims, from the Muslims and send his Nusra upon us. But this will not happen until we return back to La ilaha illallah. You see, this is a very strange thing when people analyze a situation. And they say, why is this fitna and facade occurred? People say, oh, it's because of military factors. It's because of economic factors, political factors, social factors, all of these different factors. And it goes to show you in a way that, they, that their whole analysis is faulty. Because fundamentally, when we should look at the situation, we we'll say, is the haq of Allah, is the right of Allah being fulfilled? And if the right of Allah is not being fulfilled, then Allah has sent his adhab upon us, or the least is that he's removed his ni'mah from us. He's removed the blessings that can be bestowed upon us. And so as a result of that, fitna will come upon us. That's what Allah says in the Quran, فَلْيَحْذُرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ أَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبُهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُصِيبُهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَلِيمٌ Let those beware who oppose the amr of Allah. And obviously this amr, this command, or this uh, or command upon us is to worship Allah alone. As fitna will come upon you, this is kufr. This is denying the haq of Allah. And as a result of that, you will suffer adhabun alim, great punishment. And we see the reality of this. So when the analysis of the situation, we should look at, is the haq of Allah being fulfilled? And then after, the most important hukuk that comes thereafter, the right 
of the book of Allah, okay, which is the right of Allah, because the Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is the right of the Quran being fulfilled? Is the right of the Prophet being fulfilled? Is the right of the parents being fulfilled? Is the right of the neighbor being fulfilled? Is the right of the Amatun Nas, the ordinary people being fulfilled? Is the right of the children? And you go, is the right of the trees? Look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given rights to the trees, to the animals, to the oceans. And you know, this is what, and these rights are being given so that there is this balance in the creation. So you deny the haq of Allah and for sure the fitna will come upon you. And if there was ever a hadith that made this absolutely clear to the people, there's a hadith that we find, hadith Sahih in Bukhari, when the Prophet وسلم, again he is instructing Mu'ad. Very important because you'll find this hadith is similar to the hadith when he's instructing Ibn Abbas. Similar to the advice that Luqman he gives to his son. So what this is, is that for the young person, the child that is growing up, it is so important that that child has a strong foundation in what we call the usul, the usul al deen the fundamentals of the religion. So that, that that child knows their identity, their purpose, they know their aqeedah. As a result of that, this as Allah says, فَقَدْ اِسْتَمْسَقَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَةِ that this will be the trustworthy handhold which will never break. This will be the foundation which will always remain firm and solid for that person. If the child doesn't know the aqeedah, this is going to be a fitna for that child. Because that child unfortunately is going to hear ideas and going to be confronted okay, with uh, uh, different ideas and belief systems. If you haven't got a foundation, then you're easily going to be led. And you're going to be distorted, uh, taken away from the sabil al-mu'minina to the ways of tafarraq, to the paths of deviation. So. The Prophet Sallallahu he's advising Mu'ad and he says, Ya Mu'ad, atadri ma haqqallahi ala al-ibad. He says, Oh Mu'ad, what is the right that is due to Allah and the worshipper of Allah? And Mu'ad as a young person, he and having this respect for your Ustad, obviously for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allahu Rasuluhu A'lam. Allah and his messenger, they know best. And so then the Prophet replied that the right that is due to Allah from the worshipper of Allah that the person worships Allah alone without any partners and does not make shirk with Allah. So this is the right of the abd, of the slave of Allah, of the human being that Allah Ta'ala has created to Allah, that you worship Allah alone without making any partners to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the justice of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Allah who is Al-Adl, the justice that He gives to His creation. And then, uh, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, what is the right which is due then back? And Muad said, Allah and His Messenger know best. And then the Prophet said, that Allah Ta'ala does not punish this person. So this is the right which is due back, subhanAllah. That you worship Allah, you give the haq to Allah, which is you worship Him alone without any partners. The right then which is due back from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you is that you will not be punished, subhanAllah. And that you will be entered into paradise. Ya Allah, make us of those who are not punished. And so this is how important, brothers. This is why we always, this is from our manhaj, the manhaj of the sunnah, is that we always go back to revise the subject of Tawheed. And we always go back to Kitab al-Tawheed and to learn from the ulama, the ayat and the hadith that they have collected from the Prophet Wasallam, which instruct us to stick firm, hold firm to the path of Tawheed and to avoid the shirk and close the door towards shirk. No matter how much you have studied, you need to go back and revise this subject and, and, you know, and revise it as much as you need to revise the subject. Because we find, unfortunately, there is people today, it goes to show you the weakness in the Tawheed, that when you ask them to look upon a situation, so I remember this Shaykh, he sent his students, he says, go and look at the state of the people. So they went and looked at the state of the people. And then they came back, he said, yeah, Shaykh, there is some real fitna that is occurring in our town. And he said, what is that? They said, there is a house of prostitution. People are going and they're paying money and they're making zina in this way. And so obviously this is a bad, this is from the Qaba'ir, the major sins. This is obviously a very wicked and terrible thing. But then what the people did not see is that at the same time the people were making shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. That they were, yet they did not see that the shirk, rather they saw this fitna and they did not see the fitna of shirk that was also taking place. And what is worse is obviously the shirk. Because as we know Allah Ta'ala, He forgives everything. 
Okay, Allah Ta'ala, he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ عَنْ يُشْرَكْ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءَ Verily, Allah will forgive every single sin, except the sin of shirk, which Allah will not forgive. Allah forgives every sin, no matter how bad that sin is. When the person turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sincere repentance, whether you killed a hundred people, whether you are a zani, whether you are a drunkard, whether you are a drug taker, whatever your sin is, you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you make sincere repentance to Allah, your sin is wiped away. But you could have all of the hasanat in the world. You could have billions and billions of good deeds. But if you are a mushrik, one who makes partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to judge, then none of that, none of those good deeds will register at all because you did the worst zulm. You committed the worst oppression, which is to deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is Al-Malik, who is your, uh, your creator, who is Ghafoor al-Rahim, who is more merciful to you than anything else. You denied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his right. And so this is why this subject has to be revised. So we close the door towards shirk in every single one of its forms. And also we should know that again, so, you know, that there is no revival. There is no islah of the Muslim world. We cannot revive the Muslims without tawheed and firm tarbiyya upon this. And this also relates to the question which will be in the kabul, in, in the qabr, in the grave. So when you are questioned in the grave, and when you are assembled on Yawm al-Qiyamah, the matters which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you about are the matters of Asul al-Din, the fundamentals of the religion, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the following of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the following of this deen. He ain't going to ask you about the matters of the waqiyah. He ain't going to ask you about other issues. These are the fundamental questions. In the grave, when Munkan and Nakir hold you to account, they say, who is your Lord? They will ask you about your Tawheed. If your Tawheed is not solid and firm and has no weakness in it, if there is shuk in this matter, then for sure you will be confused in the grave when you are questioned. You say you don't know who your Lord is, you worship whoever, your heart was taken whichever, and you made shirk with Allah, na'uzubillah, whether it's Akbar or Asghar, even still this is a weakness. And know that the strengthening in the grave, the ability to answer this question, who is your Lord? And the others, who is the, what is your deen? And who is this man referring to the Prophet wasallam? Your ability to answer these questions is based upon your yaqeen in this world and your firmness in this world. That's what Allah says, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ بِالْقَوْلِ ثَابِتِ فِي الْحِيَاتِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ That Allah Ta'ala will keep those people who will remain firm with a qawl in this world and in the hereafter. So your statement will be firm. In the kabr, in the grave. Why? Because you lived upon firmness. You were sure about this matter. You were not confused about this matter at, at all. And so that's why, again, this is this this. As I said, the seriousness of the subject is concerned with what it's about and what the consequence of that, and also what is the reward of that, and the reward of tawheed, the reward of having firm understanding of the kalima is nothing other than paradise. So that's why this subject it deserves so much importance. Another one of the hadith, and there's many, many, is that a man will come on the day of, of, of judgment and his ma'asi, his book of, of uh, you know, his scrolls of sins, okay, uh, 99 of them. Each of them, when they're opened up, they are the longer than the distance between the east and the west, subhanAllah. 99 scrolls like this, a wicked man, an evil man, subhanAllah. And no way do we justify the wickedness and evilness that man did. And then that's put on one side of the scales. And then another parchment, bitaka, like a ticket, like a piece of paper. A parchment is bought, small piece of paper, and it is put upon the other side of the scale. Now obviously, you know, one will not think that this small ticket is going to outweigh all these 99 scrolls. But this one ticket outweighs those 99 scrolls. That shows how thaqila, how heavy this matter is. And what is on there except nothing other than La ilaha illallah. So this outweigh, this is the greatness of this aspect of fiqh. Obviously, Allah Ta'ala in His Rahm forgave that person. We haven't got this guarantee that we will be forgiven. Because of the, he still had that sincerity with which he affirmed that kalima, La ilaha illallah. So brothers, learn a basic Aqeedah text. It's very important for us to do, whether it's, uh, again, we start off with 
Shara Asul al Iman, understanding of the fundamentals of the religion, simple books like this. And then we move on to Thalath Asul, the three principles of, uh, you know, uh, explanation of, again, Tawheed. Then we go on to Gitab al Tawheed. And then we go on to books such as Aqidatul uh, Wasatiya and Aqidat Tahawiya with an explanation. So this is something which is very important and recommended for us to do. Do it frequently so that you continue to revise these principles. Also, the Prophet said Islam is built upon five. I've explained this to do. Obviously, the Shahadatain, the Kalima, is the foundation upon which everything else is built. So, this is because this is the foundation. You know, when we look at the foundation of a building, the higher that building goes, and the best example is that shard. You know, you've seen the shard, the book, the building in London that they've built. You see, it goes up like a principle. Obviously, the foundation has to be very, very strong. And this is, uh, otherwise you cannot build. The higher you build, depends on the stronger the foundation. And so the foundation has to be La ilaha illallah. And this is what, upon which, which you build your salah, and etc, etc. Another statement as well to explain the importance of the rights of Allah. Also the statement of Ibn Umar radiallahu an, he said, who said, we spent a period of time learning Iman before we learned Quran. Then we learned Quran and it increased us in Iman. So what this statement it means, is that they learn the usul al deen the foundations of the religion first, the, i.e. the rights of Allah first. Then they learn the ahkam, the rules and regulations of Islam. So they had this foundation, they built a very strong foundation first. And then when they built that foundation, then when they learned the ahkam, he said, then when we learned the Quran, i.e. the ahkam, rules and regulations of Islam, we were increased in Iman. Their action was increased even more. He said, I've seen the people who do the opposite. They learn Quran before Iman. Yani they learn the rules and regulations of Islam. They haven't got the strong foundation. They haven't established that strong foundation of their aqidah and their Iman in Allah and the Asuluddin, the fundamentals of the religion. As a result, said, I've seen them read the whole text of the Quran from the beginning to the end without learning anything from it and without in any way being changed by it. So they do not increase. Zadatum iman, they do not increase in Iman from reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because the foundation is not there. So when we go on to the matter of the kalima, what is important for us to uh, understand with regards to the kalima is that the kalima is a statement and this is where we now get to really understand the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're going to go through what these different rights that need to be fulfilled. That uh, the kalima itself is what we call affirmation and a negation. Nafi wal ithbat. And that's why some of the scholars when they divided the categories of tawheed, they divided it into tawheed wal ma'rifa wal ithbat and tawheed talab wal qasd. They used to call this two categories. There is the tawheed of ma'rifa, knowledge, understanding wal ithbat and affirming that knowledge. And there is the tawheed of action, okay, and uh, uh, it, uh, it, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, action and, uh, you know, uh, of, of the body. So this is the two aspects. Other scholars, as we know, frequently they divided the Tawheed into three categories. And the reason the scholars did this is so that it made it easy for the student to learn in a structured way. This is why they've done it. So another, uh, you know, more common, uh, like I said, classification is where the scholars, they divided Tawheed into two Tawheed Rububiyya. Knowing the Tawheed of the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah ta'ala is Rabbil Alameen and Allah ta'ala is the Lord, Master of this whole creation and that nothing is similar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No other Lord or Master of the creation okay, contends with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the Tawheed of Allah ta'ala's Rububiyya. So the shirk of this is to take as a Lord others beside Allah. Arbab min dunillah. As Lord someone other besides Allah. Then there is after Tawheed Rububiyya. After you acknowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only Lord and Master of this creation. What is natural that comes from that is what we call Tawheed Uluhiyya. That the person or Tawheed Al-Ibadah as others say. That the people then make their worship solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they deny the worship of anything else beside Allah. It cannot be that you just worship Allah but at the same time you're worshipping others. No. Worshipping of Allah means, as he said, ifbat, affirmation, and then the nafi, the, the negation is that you have to deny the worship of everything else besides Allah. And I'm going to explain it with some uh, uh, examples in a minute. So this is the Tawheed Uluhiyya. 
And the shirk in uluhiyya is that where you perform an act of ibadah, an act of submission to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be in the form of dua or wasila, making your wasila to other than Allah ta'ala. As Allah says in the Quran, wabtahu ilayhi wasila, make your wasila directly to me, yet the person he makes a wasila to other than Allah, ghayr Allah. This is contradicting the right due to Allah, which is that you make your wasila to Him, your dua, your plea, your, your, your uh, like I said, your invocation directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you make dhab, slaughter. We slaughter in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the person slaughters in the name of other than Allah, for ghayrullah, for something else, then again, this is a shirk. This is giving the sacred sacrifice to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obviously, sajda, if one sajda is due only to Rabbil Alameen. The person bows to anyone else besides Allah, and this is a bowing of sujood, of submission, then this is shirk that the person has given this to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the, the tawheed uluhiyya and the shirk in uluhiyya. And the third aspect of tawheed is tawheed asma wa sifat, <coughs> that to worship Allah, to believe in Allah ta'ala's names and attributes, that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed and uh, in the Quran and the sunnah. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described himself in the Quran and Sunnah. As Muslims, we affirm the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described himself with his names and attributes. We do not make any ta'wil or any interpolation upon this beyond okay, that which Allah ta'ala has given us. And we do not make any ta'atil, which is that we do not deny any of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor do we make what we call tashbih, make any similarity between them and anything in the creation. Because Allah, he says in the Quran, you know, that Allah ta'ala, there is nothing like unto him. Laysa kumithlihi shay. الْبَصِيرِ That is nothing like unto Allah. Or Allah is all seeing and all hearing. So Allah to Allah belongs the attributes of hearing and seeing. But His hearing and seeing is not like ours. There is no tashbi similarity between Allah and ours because Allah Ta'ala sees all things and hears all things. And whereas our seeing and hearing obviously is in no way comparable to this. That's why, again, we make no tashbih, we make no takif, which is that <coughs> regarding the asma wa sifat of Allah, we do not ask how. Because how can we say Allah, you know, when Allah, for example, describes that He makes an nuzul, that He descends, then we say Allah Ta'ala, He descends in a way which is befitting of His majesty. We do not ask as one person came up to Imam Malik, rahimullah, and then the Malik, Imam Malik said, you are zindik. The person said, how does Allah descend? He said, this question is bidah, and this opens the door towards kufr and shirk. We don't ask how, we just affirm that Allah Ta'ala, He descends in a way which is befitting of His messenger. In the same way, we do not make what we call, uh, like I said, a tahrif. We don't try to explain how, or we don't distort the meaning. For example, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa, that Allah Ta'ala is established above His Arsh. So Allah Ta'ala, He is, uh, you know, is, to, uh, you know is, is established above His throne in a way which is befitting of His Majesty. We do not say, we do not say that the throne, the Arsh of Allah, refers to the power of Allah, the Quwa of Allah. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu did not do this. So therefore, we cannot explain this matter any further. So this is the Tawheed of Asma wa Sifat. So these are the three categories there. But regarding the going back onto the kalima, La ilaha illallah. First, we have what we call a negation. La ilah. There is no object. And an ilah, the plural bring, bling, aliha. Okay, an aliha means something which is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we begin, La illa. There is no object which is worthy of worship, illallah, except Allah. And Allah is what we call a definite noun, only one. And so what we are doing is that we are denying worship to all of the aliha and affirming the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is uh, the, uh, the, the reality of what is Tawheed. Now, Again, when we talk about this, is such an important subject because when you ask many of the people today, and we always often ask this question, not to trip them up, not to confuse them in any way, but we ask them, explain to us what is the meaning of the kalima, la ilaha illallah. Explain what this means. And often most people will say, there is no God besides Allah. 
And in fact, you'll see still big posters, there is no God besides Allah. And increasingly over the last 20 years, I've seen that the people now, Alhamdulillah, are getting better in their understanding where they, are, where they are now putting, they don't translate it as no God besides Allah, but rather they translate it as more now, there is no deity or there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. So Alhamdulillah, there is an improvement in the understanding of the people. But you ask many of the people, their kalima is not la ilaha illallah, it's la rabb illallah. Okay, there is no Lord except Allah. So this is a, a, a kind of a weakness in terms of many of the people. Because what they do is they affirm the rububiyyah of Allah, but they are not affirming what we call the uluhiyyah of Allah. So let me explain what this means. In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Quraysh, although they were mushriks who worshipped idols, 360 or so of them, besides Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, they still believed in Allah. And they still had the kalima, that, la ilaha illallah, but obviously, you know, they took their idols as intermediaries between themselves and Allah. Even when they're asked, these idols made of sticks and stones, why do you worship them when they have no power in themselves? They said, yes, we know they have no power within themselves. We only use them as a wasila or an intermediary between our, them ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas Allah ta'ala, he doesn't need any intermediary. Any individual, this is the beauty of Islam, the only religion on the world, in the earth that does this, which enables every person to call directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, speak directly to Allah ta'ala and call directly upon Him. You do not need anyone between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your conjurer, as your intermediary, as your saint, as your peer, whatever. You don't need anything in between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the Quraysh, again, when they were challenged, who is the one that makes the night into day and the day into night? They would say Allah. Who is the one who gives life and who takes life? They would say Allah. So they accepted the rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then why is it that they did not then make the uluhiyyah, make their worship pure for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reject all of the other tagut and the idols? Why didn't they do this? And the reason they didn't do this, and one of the principal reasons, you'll find two principal reasons, Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Qur'an, many of the Anbiya and the Rusul, they were confronted with exactly these two things. The first, they did not want to leave the way of their forefathers, the way of their Baghdadi, the way of the people, their ancestors. He says, no, this is the way of our people. Are you saying, they, they said, said to the Prophet are you saying all of the gods become one? How ajeeb this is. Even though we know this is true, we will not leave the way of our forefathers the way of our culture, the way of our traditions. So this is the first thing. Second reason is that they knew that now that they have accepted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as their Lord and Master and Creator, they have to devote their whole life to Allah ta'ala. And so they realize this and they have to do sacrifice for the sake of Allah and they have to spend in the way of Allah. So this is the other reason that they realize this would undermine their position their sovereignty, their importance, because they had to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the reasons why the people, even though the knowledge was clear to them. So the Quraysh, they understood Tawheed. They understood it very, very clearly. Okay, they understood that Allah was Lord of all the worlds, but what they did not make is the Uluhiyyah. And unfortunately, we find the same weakness amongst many of the Muslims today. That yes, they accept Allah as Lord and Master, but what they have not done is eliminated the shirk and prevented and closed the door to worship to everything else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah says in the Quran, to every single ummah, he sent a messenger with the words, worship Allah, which is the affirmation. Reject the worship of all of the tawaheed. The kalima, okay, it requires us to affirm our worship of Allah and reject four things. Four things. First, every aliha besides Allah, and ob every object which is every andad. An andad is that which is loved besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Arbab, that which taken as a lord besides Allah. And finally, fourth, tawaheed, false gods, who again, okay, are uh, those who take us away from the worship of Allah. And we should know that the tawaheed are five. All five are to be rejected. If you do not reject the tawaheed, okay, then you are still not giving the right which is due to Allah, which is uluhiyah, pure worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, for example, okay, so the five tawaheed, Allah ta'ala, he mentions, 
in uh, our first, the first of the Taghut and chief of the Taghut. And Taghut, it means false gods and false ways. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay, uh, in, uh, I, okay, the first the chief of the Taghut is Iblis Shaitan. It's the first one. He is Aduwun Mubeen. Inna shaytana lakum adu. Verily, shaytan is your enemy. Fattakhiduhu aduwa. So take him as your enemy. Allah Ta'ala, he tells you he's your enemy. And he tells you to protect yourself from him. So shaytan, and the object of shaytan, Iblis, is nothing other than to make the people make shirk with Allah. This is all his objective is. He asked the permission of Allah Ta'ala. Leave me upon the creation so I can mislead your servants. That's the only, and Allah has given him the permission. So his power is only by Ibn Allah, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his sultan, his power is only over those people who make shirk. You open the door towards shirk, you have opened the door of shaitan. And those people who have iman and tawakkul in Allah, the shaitan and iblis and his awliya have no authority over them. So this is what Allah says in the Quran, فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالطَّاغُوتِ وَيُعْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ اِسْتَمْسَقَ بِالْأُرْوَةِ الْوَثْقَ لَنْ فِي السَّامَ لَهُوَ اللَّهُ سَمِينَ عَلِيمٌ That those people who disbelieve in Taghut, believe in Allah, as I mentioned, this is the verse which comes after Ayat Al-Qudsi, have grasped the trustworthy handhold which will never break. Then Allah says, اللَّهُ وَلِيُّ الَّذِينَ آمُنُوا يُخْرِجُهُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ that those people who believe Allah Ta'ala, He guides them from darkness into light. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَوْلِيَاءُهُمُ الطَّاغُوتِ يُخْرِجُونَهُمْ مِنَ النُّورِ إِلَى الظُّلُمَاتِ أُولَيْكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ As for those people who disbelieve awliya of the Ta'ghut and have become friends with the Ta'ghut, they are guided from light, from fitra, from being people who have been given hidayah and guidance to darkness of shirk and kufr. And as a result, they will be the dwellers of the fire, okay? Uh, and and uh, they will be obviously people who are entered into the, the fire. So this is the first one, shaitan. And so that's why we have to close the door towards shaitan. Number two, <coughs> Tahut, is the one who is pleased that he or she is worshipped as an aliha besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they are pleased with this, that people say you are a god. You are an object of worship. And then the people are pleased that that person is worshipped, revered, venerated, and uh, like I said, taken and given that position of being a God. So for, and, and one of these aspects of this, okay, is obviously the one who changes the halal to the haram and the haram to the halal. So as Allah Ta'ala, He mentions obviously, the, you know, those people, the ummas before, before us, how they took their priests and their rabbis as lords, okay, besides Arbab bin Dunillah, how Allah Ta'ala, He mentions this in, in the Qur'an. And so these people who changed the halal, they were glad that the people had taken them as objects of worship besides Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. So this includes the likes of Fir'aun. Fir'aun himself, he called himself Rabbukum al-A'la, the Lord Most High, and he was pleased that the worship, people worshipped him as a god. Others who have been venerated in this way throughout history, and that they are pleased with him, this is a person who is a Tahut. And again, look at how, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, the, the, the third category then is the one who calls, makes da'wah to other than Allah, to Ghayrullah, to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as we know, our way, أَدْعُوا إِلَى السَّبِيلِ رَبِّكَ You know, our way is, as Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ هَذِهِ السَّبِيلِ أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ بَصِيرًا Okay, that Allah says, say this is my way, I call only to Allah, عَلَىٰ بَصِيرًا with sure knowledge. أَنَا وَمَنَ تَبْعَنِي I and those people who follow me, as the Prophet ﷺ said. So this is our way, we call only the whole of the creation to worship the creator away from worshiping the things of this creation. But if you see a person who is calling people away from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calling them to the worship of the creation, no, this person is a ta'ghut, is a person who is, as the Prophet said, that you know, that uh, uh, you know, وَأَنَّ هَذَا سِرَاتِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوا وَلَا تَتَّبُوا الصُّبُلَا فَتَفَرَّقُوا بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ ذَلِكُمْ وَسَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Verily, this is my straight path, so follow it. And do not follow the paths of deviation, tafarraq, which go away from this. Because uh, 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 this he has ordered you so that you become muttaqeen. So the Prophet ﷺ, he drew a line in his sand, he said, this is the path to follow. Path of Tawheed, the path of, that leads to the paradise. The path of giving the right to Allah Ta'ala. 
And then he says the past which deviate from this. He said, upon the head of all of these is a taghut, is a shaitan who is calling you, making da'wah, okay, for tafarraqah, away from this path to his path. So beware of such the taghut. So this is number three. Number four of the taghut is the one who judges by other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. He judges by other than the hukum of Allah ta'ala. And the one who judges by other than the hukum of Allah, as Allah says, he is a kafir, he is a fasik, he is a zalim. And the grade, it varies. And see, we do not go to the extremes of making takfir of people if, we, you know, by, if they're not judging by what Allah has revealed. Okay, and also as we know the understanding of uh, uh, Ibn Abbas when he explained this verse, okay, that one who does not judge by what Allah has revealed is a disbeliever. He said this is kufr, laysa kufr. This is the lesser of the kufr. This is not kufr akbar. So this is this, the person still remains within Islam. However, if a person believes that their way, their hukum is superior than the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is there to replace, to remove, to reject the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is shirk al-akbar. Because the person has put his law, his hukum above the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is, okay, the fourth of the taghut, one who does not judge by uh, The fifth of the taghut, number five taghut, is one who claims to have ilm al ghaib knowledge of the unseen. And again, this is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alim al ghaib Allah ta'ala is the one who possesses the knowledge of the unseen. Part of this ilm, part of this knowledge he gives to a messenger whom he has chosen. As Allah says, you know, uh, uh, Allah says, Alim al ghaybi fala yudhiru ala ghaybihi ahada. He alone is the knower of the unseen and he reveals to none this knowledge of the unseen. And then he says, part of this knowledge he gives to a messenger whom he has chosen. Then Allah appoints angels to ensure that that messenger conveys that message. So when the Prophet ﷺ is talking about the matters of the ghayb, the unseen, the future events, the prophetic hadith, that these are based on nothing other than the wahi that was given to the Prophet ﷺ by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who had knowledge of this matter. And this was not given. So the Prophet ﷺ, we do not believe the Prophet ﷺ had complete knowledge of the unseen as some people do. Because by doing so that they are giving the Prophet ﷺ an attribute which can only belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alim al ghayb who has complete knowledge of the unseen. And there are many proofs within the Quran obviously which which established this, that the Prophet ﷺ did not have ilm al ghayb knowledge of the unseen. So for example, when okay, the accusation was made against Aisha radiallahu anha for 50 days, the Prophet ﷺ had to wait for wahi to come down to declare the integrity of Aisha radiallahu anha and that was revealed in Surah Al-Nur. At the battle of Uhud, if the Prophet ﷺ had the knowledge of the unseen, then why would he have allowed his beloved uncle Hamza radiallahu anhu to become shaheed upon that day? Or and the other 80 companions also. Why would you know he would have prevented this from happening? Rather Allah says, say, Allah Ta'ala he mentions, okay, say, O Muhammad, I possess no power of benefit or hurt to myself except as Allah wills. If I had knowledge of the ghaib, I should have secured for myself an abundance of wealth and no evil should have touched me. I am but a warner and a bringer of glad tidings unto people who believe. This is in the seventh surah, ayah number 44. So it establishes the Prophet ﷺ did not have this knowledge. And therefore, for anyone thereafter to claim to have ilm al ghaib, knowledge of the unseen, is attributing to themselves a quality that can only belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone claims they have knowledge of when the day of judgment will take place, this is an ilm that only belongs to Allah. And they're, so therefore, they're, and if we believe that person has that ilm, then we are making shirk na'uzu billah. That's why we close the door towards this. And it's not permissible for a Muslim to go and visit a fortune teller, a soothsayer, a kahin, an astrologer, or any of the likes. Because these are individuals or people who believe that they have knowledge of the unseen. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, one who goes to the fortune teller, even though they do not believe what that person has said, that person's salah becomes batil for 40 days. For 40 days they have to pray because that is obviously hukam upon them, obligatory upon them. But for 40 days their salah will not be accepted because they went to a fortune teller. Even going to the fortune teller, in fact, so reading the stars, astrology, you know, going on and, and the satellite TVs that deal with these kind of issues and on the internet, even entertaining these issues is shirk. 
and it invalidates the salah because and, and the way that one has to see it isn't oh this is a laugh or a joke because we see and in particular quite a lot of uh, women unfortunately they find themselves tempted by these issues oh look I'm a Leo or I'm an Aries or something like this and they're saying oh look at my stars today this is what is going to happen to me today and it's ajeeb that the astrologer is ajeeb that the person the one who's the astrologer he says by the movement of the stars I am that person is able to uh, uh, identify what your qadr, your decree is going to be. It's ajeeb. That the one who's the creator of all the stars, they deny his rak and they think they have a knowledge better than the one who is the creator of all the stars. In Kitab al-Tawheed, there's a mention of a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ on one occasion after Salat al-Fajr, he turns to his congregation. He says, some of you have believed and some of you have disbelieved. It's very important adab of the Prophet ﷺ in terms of advising the jama'ah. Very important. He did not say you and you and you have disbelieved and you and you have believed. He didn't do that. Because by targeting people, you make them feel embarrassed, ashamed. And also you make the people who are not embarrassed, you put them in them kibbutz, pride. Oh, we are right and they're wrong. No, rather when it's a jama'ah, the person, the way to advise the jama'ah is in the general sense like this. If you need to invite someone one on one, take them away, take them in privacy. Take them away from the people and advise them. And, and then only advise them if you are the right person to advise them. If you've got an elder, don't send one of the young people to advise the elders. And you know, this is some of the, some of the etiquettes that we have in relation to... So the Prophet said, he said, those of you who believe that the rain fell because of the movement of the stars have disbelieved, have made shirk. And those people who believe that the rain fell because it was the hukum of Allah Ta'ala have believed. So these are, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, the companions, Especially after, after the conquest of Makkah, there were many who were still weak in terms of their Iman. So the person who goes to the fortune teller, to the soothsayer, to any of these people, even though they don't believe in them, believes in uh, uh, tarot cards, Ouija boards, all of this, is claiming that they have a knowledge that can only belong to Allah Subhanahu wa Just another point here regarding the ghaib. Regarding the the ghaib is of three types. The unseen knowledge, three types. There is that which has happened in the past that we are not aware of. That is that which is happening now, but elsewhere. So what is happening on Leeds Road now? It's ghaib. We don't know what's happening at this moment in Leeds Road. Okay? Uh, or somewhere else in a, someone's house or something like this. So this is another aspect of, of the ghaib. The third aspect of the ghaib is that which will happen in the future. Now in terms of what has happened in the past, and all of this knowledge in its entirety, belongs to Al Alim Al Khabir, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, who is perfect in knowledge and perfect in awareness. The knowledge of the past, some aspects of the past, obviously this knowledge can be obtained through historical records, but also through the shayateen and through the jinn who are aware of these issues by consulting with them, then you can also have this knowledge. That's why it's become haram. It's haram for the person to consult with the jinn. Okay, and the one who does this, is doing sihr, is doing magic. And again, this is, a, this is why sihr is kufr and shirk. Because the further person to do magic and to truly be a magician of this nature, one has to have made shirk in order for them to gain the support of a jinn. The jinn, amongst us, as amongst the uh, insan, we have obviously, uh, you know, believers, disbelievers, and munafikun. Likewise, amongst the jinn, there are believers, disbelievers, and munafikun. And so the believing jinn who believe in Tawheed, like we believe in Tawheed, of course, they will observe the hukum of Allah that is in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they will realize that they are not allowed to communicate with this world. And they're not allowed to have so. If, whereas obviously the disbeliever ones and the munafikun amongst them, they have this. They will, you know, if the person is making magic and they will go in league with the person who is mag doing in magic. I, and for this to happen, as I said, the magician has to make shirk with Allah in order for this to take place. So therefore the one who obviously is doing the magic, that's why this person who is uh, identified as a magician is punished according to the Sharia with death. This is something which... Uh, the one who goes to a magician and takes... Obviously he's making shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's believing that this person obviously has knowledge of the unseen and he's using these malevolent arts to cause affliction upon people as well. So through the jinn it's possible to have this knowledge as well. Through the jinn it's also possible to know what is happening in other places at this time, but not within immediate, but within a short period of time. As we know when uh, in Suleiman when he called for the throne of Bilqis to come, it came in the blink of an eye. 
So this is the power that they, they, we believe that the uh, that the jinn have that they are able to. But in relation to the future events, none none can claim this. This is the knowledge which only belongs to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. If anyone claims this ilm, then they are someone who has made shirk with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So these are the tawaqid which are to be rejected, uh, and. And another, and I'll finish with this inshallah. Um, so another way we can understand the rights that are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although there's a couple of hadith I wanted to go through, okay, uh, first in, that we have in Kitab al-Tawheed, again, uh, about the uluhiyyah, making the worship of Allah. Two hadith, uh, because these hadith, you know, subhanAllah, three, actually three hadith mentioned in Kitab al-Tawheed. First is the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he mentioned on account of flies, you know, the little flies that fly around. A man was sent to paradise and another was sent to, sent to the hellfire. So this is related to those people who slaughter, make dhab in the name of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like I said, every act of worship is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you swear an oath, very important brothers, when we swear the oath, we can only say Wallahi by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't say anything else because this is well, obviously to swear in the name of Allah, and you hear again the people they get this bad language, they pick it up and they say things like, you know, by my mother, okay, or by my children's eyes, <laughs> you know, things like this, yeah, they're strange things, swearing. Obviously, you know, how can you hold your mother to account? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, obviously he swears upon the creation. Wateen wa zaytun, or you know, uh, like I said, many other things that Allah ta'ala, Allah ta'ala is able to hold the whole creation to account. That's why. But can I hold the mountain to account? Can I hold my mother to account? Of course not. So obviously swearing in other than the lie is not allowed. For the Muslim, they swear only by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you are ever required to make an oath, swear by Allah. And obviously we have this thing that's what about swearing upon with your hand upon the Quran. So swearing upon the Quran is also allowed. Why? Because you are still swearing by Allah. Because you are swearing by the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we should know, as you know, the word of Allah ta'ala is the speech of Allah, which will return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is also something which is allowed. But we swear our oaths only by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's a very serious thing. Again, another adab that people fall into or a bad habit that people fall into. I hear it. People are saying all the time, Wallahi, 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 like this. Oh Wallahi, okay, you know, Aqsam Billah, and they, they say it like this, Qasam, Qasam, Allah di Qasam, they say these things. And they say this so easily. Brothers, it's a very serious matter. Very serious matter. Don't swear except when you need to swear an oath. Only, and then people will take you swear seriously. It's like, you know, people say, Inshallah, you know what this means. It means it's not going to happen, yeah? All right, although that is still the will of Allah. Don't say Aqsam Billah or Qasam or Wallahi, don't say this unless you actually mean it. If you swear something and you break your oath, there is a kafara. There is something which is obviously you have to expiate for this as well. So this is a very serious matter. Do not break your oath. And when you when you make this oath. second thing, so a person he goes. So this is a hadith where it's related that people that were traveling through a land, and the people had an idol in that land, and that idol, uh, the people they said that you cannot travel unless you give an offering to the idol. Unless you give an offering to the idol. And the person says, I have nothing to give. He says, okay, go and get some flies. Sacrifice some flies and give it. So the man found some flies, some makiya, some flies. Sacrificed them to the idols and the man was allowed to pass. And now, Billah, this person was sent to the hellfire on account of this action of shirk. So look at shaitan. He wants you to make shirk. Even if something as a... He wants to pollute, pollute and corrupt your tawheed even by a fraction like this. By sacrificing a fly, the person is denied the paradise. The next person passing by, he says, you have to sacrifice. He says, I refuse to sacrifice. It reminds me of the hadith of Abu Darda. Don't make shirk with Allah, even if they cut you to pieces and burn you alive. Don't make shirk with Allah. وَلَا تُمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُ مُسْلِمُونَ Die only as Muslim, as Muwahid. And the so person firm upon this tawheed, the person refused, they killed him. And obviously this man, he went to paradise. Another aspect uh, mentioned in Kitab al-Tawheed is, as we often mention in the 
khutbatul haja that he who Allah guides cannot be misguided. He who Allah misguides, there is no one who can guide such a person aright. Hidayah is in the hands of Al Hadi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who guides someone, opens up their heart towards Islam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he's telling his uncle Abu Talib on his deathbed, say la ilaha illallah, say la ilaha illallah, say the kalima and I will intercede, I will make shifa for you on yawm al qiyamah. And the last one tells says, not you who guides. It's very painful for the Prophet ﷺ that his uncle did not. And even when, why did Abu Talib not accept Islam? He said, because the people will say, that because of the fun that said the people make on the, about the sons of Abu Talib, that, that they have followed the religion of other than their forefathers. Because of his love for his Baghdad and for what the people were saying, this is why he did not say the kalima, La ilaha illallah. But Allah Ta'ala is saying, it's not you who guides, it's Allah who guides. There's an important principle here in da'wah as well, that remember this brothers, our responsibility is just to give the da'wah. It's just to give the message. Give the message as clearly as possible. فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ لَسْتَ عَلِيهِمْ بِمُسَيْتِرْ That you remind the people so that they are reminded, so it's clear. As Allah also says, لا إكراه فدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي There is no compulsion in religion. Truth is clear from falsehood. Just convey the message. Try to make it as clear as possible so that the people have understood it. Leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is مقلب القلوب, the change of the hearts. If you think that you are the one who can change the person, you are the one, oh, I'm, I'm such a good da'i, I'm the one who's going to convince him. Then this is, a, and it's, this is itself a type of shirk. This is, a shirk of, uh, this is a kind of shirk al-askar, a minor type. You are the one who thinks that I am the one who will convince him. No, rather Allah Ta'ala is the one who guides and Allah is the one who changes. Next hadith is another hadith which is where mentioned in this and about conjuring on stones and trees. It's in this particular section. Again, the right which is due to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That Allah Ta'ala is the one who gives, bestows his, uh, bestows barakah upon the creation. If we believe that we can gain tabarak from other than what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has prescribed, this is shirk. Tabarak, it means gaining barakah from such a thing. Obviously, Al-Quran is a source of tabarak, a blessing. And so we can use the Quran, shifa and wa rahmah as a shifa. So the Quran is a source of tabarak. You know, and so, uh, you know, our, our uh, like I said, uh, uh, belief that something is only a source of tabarak and blessing if it is clearly prescribed by a verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If it is not from these two sources, we cannot say this is, a, this is a source of blessings. Anyway, in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after the bat for conquest of Makkah, before the battle of Hunayn, they were going to Hunayn. And in Hunayn, as we know, many of the new Muslims, they ran away. So it shows that their tawheed was weak. The people who remain firm with the Prophet in Hunayn are the ones who were with him from Makkah. 13 years whose tarbiyah upon Tawheed was strong. They remain firm with the Prophet So again it shows you the firmness of the Tawheed. So, that, so uh, uh, when they're going to this battle, they passed by this tree. It's similar to the tree that the idol worshippers would hang their weapons upon the tree. And then they would sleep underneath the tree. Thinking that this tree would be a source of tabarak, blessing, would bless them when they're going to the battle. So they pass by this tree and then one, one of the Muslims, again, we then still learning the religion. He says to the Prophet Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu make us a, the name team tree's name was Dat and what? Make us a Dat and what? Like they have a Dat and what? Make us a tree like they have a tree. Give us a tree like this. So we sleep under it and we have tabarak from this. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Allahu Akbar. You have replied just as Bani Israel did to Musa alayhi salam. Make us a God like they have a God. You're indeed ignorant people. So the, look what the Prophet said. He said how that the people, you know, have this thing that they want to, this tashbih, this similarity. Whoever imitates the people is of them. And this worst imitation is the matters of aqaid that the people will say, give us, a, like I said, a blessed thing like they have a blessed thing. And today, unfortunately, the Muslims, they still have this aspect that give us a dot and what, like they have a dot and what. So we see these aspects of shirk, okay, that come from other religions into our religion. So we see one aspect of this. And I give this story only as a way of uh, explanation, just and, uh, that we see the people today, okay, we see many people whose belief is in worshipping and veneration of idols. You will see that a person will go to a shop 
or to an idol maker and will purchase an idol made of wood, made of uh, stone, plaster, made of steel or iron, made of plastic, you know, made of paper, you know, they'll purchase this idol. An idol which has itself been made. If you see it, they might even have the name of the idol uh, maker on it. As we know, the father of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Azad, he was an idol maker. And uh, look at the other with which Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's calling his father, Ya Abi, come and leave this way. And then as we know the story of how Ibrahim alayhi salam destroyed the idols, but left the big idol in place, just to show them the rationale of the, the futility of their idol worship. So the person he worships, he buys this idol, made by the hands of another person, manufactured by a machine that is also made by another person. He buys this idol with his own money, her own money, then carries this idol home. When he gets to this home, he has a particular shrine built or a place for worship and puja within his home and then he lifts up the idol to a venerated place, places it there. And all this time the idol is dependent upon the one who's carrying it, bought it, etc, etc. And then when he places it upon the shelf, he starts saying to the idol, Okay, Ya Rab, Oh my Lord, Oh my Master, Oh my Protector, Oh my Provider, and give me, protect me, help me, etc, etc. So this is a person who at all time this idol is, that is dependent upon him, then suddenly the role is reversed and he starts to ask this idol. And we will say that this is something which does not make sense. This is something which goes against the fitrah. Allah Ta'ala has created us to worship that which is most worthy of worship. The creator of all things. Allah who is khaliq. Allah who is as-samad, eternal, absolute, in need of nothing. Wahid al-Qahar, the one upon whom everything depends and he depends upon none. Al-Ghani, the one who is most rich. This is the one that we worship. And, and I haven't got time to go into the technical aspect. I'll be here too long. I'm not going to go, go I mean, 10, 15, 10 minutes more, inshallah. So, the, so this we think is ajeeb. But then, and, and the people have seen this, but then Muslims whose aqidah is weak, they have seen this and said, give us a data and what? Like they have a data and what? So instead, a pious person, and this goes on to another one of the chapters which is in Kitab al Tawheed and the right of Allah. Do not make ghulu, as Allah says in the Quran, okay, that you know, Ya Ahlul Kitab, la taghlu, okay, uh, you know, don't make ghulu in the matters of your deen. That's what Allah says to those people before us. Don't go to extremes. The Prophet said, don't become ghulat, which means exaggerate the praise of people to the extent that that person will then become venerated too much. And when we learn of how shirk it started, it started when there were five righteous worshippers of Allah. Wad, Sawa, Yahud, Ya'uq and Nasr. Five worshippers of Allah. And the people, uh, people, like I said, followed their way. They were aw truly awliya of Allah. When they passed away, the people remembered them. And then another generation passed, shaitan came and whispered and said, make a picture of them. Make pictures of them. So that you remember them, when you see them, you remember them. So people made pictures of them and when they would look at them, they would remember that they called to Tawheed. They passed away, next generation came, they forgot what these pictures were and then they started to worship the pictures. And then they started to make them into idols and these were eventually the idols then which were placed into the Kaaba. So this is how the exaggeration. So similarly we have a situation today where there is a person who claims to, you know, the people claim this person is a Wali Allah. This person is a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really, you look at the history of the Imams of Sunnah. Great people who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all their lives, firm upon Tawheed. You did not find these people saying that they were Wali Allah. You do not, because this is not from the way of a Muslim to say, I, I am someone who is great. Or, okay, so this is, you know, you know, rather the person is humble and says that they are nothing. They are miskeen, they are fuqara, they are munafiq. This is the way that people who truly have this iman, they have the discretion. So the person will say, that the people who rather claim this person is a wali Allah. After the person passes away, when a person dies, the ruh has been taken away from them. The person cannot even close their eyes. So one has to come and close the person's eyes. And the body is to be carried. It is to be washed. You have to give istanja to the body. Then you have to make a ghusl of the body. Then you have to wrap the body in its coffin. Then you have to carry the body to the janazah. And in the janazah, you ask Allah to forgive the mayyid, the one who's passed away. Then you carry that. And then you put that into the grave. You have to go into the grave, carry the body and place the grave and put it on its side. And then you cover it with earth. 
at all this point the body is mutaji, is dependent upon you. Then as soon as it goes into the grave, the person then builds a shrine upon this and starts to say, Oh, the one in who is in the grave, give us hifaza, give us protection, give us risk, fill the womb of my, of my wife. And you start to call on the one who is in the grave, the one who is dead and cannot hear you and the one in, in the grave who cannot hear you, you start to call on them and make wasila through them rather than directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, this is an example of make us a dat and what, like they have a dat and what. And the door to this was opened towards shrine worship, through worshipping of saints and veneration of saints and taking them not as inspirations and guides. Of course, people who came and were upon the sunnah and we see their example and they taught us how to follow the example of the Messenger Wasallam. this is fine. But those people who we have taken to the extreme that they themselves have become an aliha besides Allah, Obviously, this has gone to the extremes in this particular matter. So the kalima la ilaha illallah, just to finish with brothers, is the most important statement that is made. This is the difference between Jannah and Jahannam. This, is the most, this statement has had more impact on history than any other statement that has been made. This statement divides the whole of humanity in terms of those people who believe in it and those people who disbelieve in it. This is, as I said, is the scales. La ilaha illallah determines paradise or hellfire. That's how important this statement is. So the kalima, la ilaha illallah, it is the key to paradise. The Prophet ﷺ said, one who says this kalima with iman, with ikhlas, with yaqeen, with siddiq, with truthfulness, then the paradise is guaranteed for such a person. So this is how important this kalima is. But the kalima has conditions, okay? And these are its shurut. Just so the key, okay, requires teeth. The teeth of this key are the shurut or the conditions of the kalima. And the conditions of the kalima broadly are about seven conditions of the kalima that are established by the scholars in the kitab and, and the sunnah. And each of the, as I said, the, Quran, the kalima is nafi wal ithbat, affirmation and negation. And so therefore, each of these affirms the kalima and affirms that you have given the right to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the opposite of it means you, you have denied the kalima and that you have denied the haq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So condition number one is that the kalima is made, okay, based with, with firm knowledge and understanding. As Allah says in the Quran, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ So know that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah alone and then seek forgiveness for your sins. So the first condition is al-ilm, knowledge. That the affirmation of the kalima has to be based upon knowledge and understanding. That the person is clear about what they are affirming. And also the person understands from this, there's a qaida which comes from this principle. Ilm qablu amal, that knowledge comes before action. That knowledge is the imam of action. And Imam Bukhari, rahimullah, he established this, this, this in the book of knowledge which is one of the, the, the first book in his Jamia Sahih and from the first hadith from that first in the, in the book of Ilm is the book, in ter, uh, is the hadith, the chapter on how the knowledge of the wahi came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he describes the story of Jibra'il Alayhi Salam and the wahi coming to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The transfer from Jibra'il Alayhi Salam squeezed him. Ikra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Because Imam Bukhari wanted to establish this clear principle, knowledge comes before action. Then you've got the book of Salah and it's a book of uh, Wudu and Salah and Tahara and all the other books. But first comes the book of knowledge. And then the first, from the first, um, uh, from the foremost hadith there is then how the knowledge came to the Prophet i.e. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it down from the sama, from Allah al-Mahfuz to Jibreel alayhi salam, who gave it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi who then conveyed it to his sahaba radiallahu anhum. This is ilm. This is knowledge. Ilm is that which teaches us the absolute truth of a matter. No shak, no doubt, no confusion. This is knowledge. And knowledge is only qala Allah, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And our uluhiyya, our worship is based upon that which is clearly established in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa as it was understood by the companions. So the first condition is knowledge. The opposite <coughs> of knowledge is jahiliyyah, is ignorance. 
And so therefore, the more ignorant the person is, the more this negates your Tawheed. And also, not only that, in terms of this ignorance, Okay, as Allah says in the Quran that the one who does not follow the Millet of Ibrahim is, uh, you know, is a fool unto himself. That the person, okay, has the lowest level of knowledge because they have not had that secured the knowledge of La ilaha illallah. Ibn al Qayyim said that this knowledge is more important than the water we drink and the air that we breathe and the food that we eat. That's how important this knowledge is. Obviously, without food and water and air, you die. But you die as someone who is upon Tawheed, La ilaha illallah. That this knowledge is much more important than these things. Then this, this food and this air, it feeds the jism. But what feeds the ruh is the correct understanding, this fiqh al-akbar. Like I said, the fiqh, the importance of the fiqh is related to the subject matter. And there is no more important subject than the fulfilling the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, do not give precedence to the other branches of fiqh. Do not give uh, more importance to them than fiqh al-akbar. And also it's interesting that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah, one of the few books that are attributed to him is Fiqh al-Akbar. He wrote a book called Fiqh al-Akbar. And this book Fiqh al-Akbar is nothing other than the book uh, you know, uh, on Aqeedah and on Tawheed. So this is number one. Okay, Al-Ilm is the affirmation and uh, al -ign ignorance, Shak, Shubuhat and Jahiliyyah is a denial. Number two, al yaqeen Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمُنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِ وَأَنْفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ وَمُصَادِقُونَ The believers are only those who believe in Allah and His Messenger. Thereafter, ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا They have no doubt, full yaqeen upon this matter. And, uh, and, and as a result, they strive with their lives and their wealth in the service of Allah Ta'ala. Such are the ones who are truthful. The opposite of al yaqeen is, as we know, Doubt, okay, uh, you know, the person who, uh, like I said, is certain, the opposite of certainty is the person is confused. And the more confusion you have, and so again, you know, uh, uh, when the person in the grave, okay, when you, after you're questioning the grave, a man will come of beautiful appearance, and you will say, who are you? He said, I am your hasanat, I am your good deeds. And then the person will say, you were quick in the obedience of Allah, slow in the disobedience of Allah. You lived upon Yaqeen, you died upon Yaqeen, inshallah you are raised up upon Yaqeen, certainty. The opposite of the one who is was sinful, disobeyed Allah, okay, he's a man of, of wicked appearance will come, he said, who are you? He said, I'm your deeds. He says, you were slow in the obedience of Allah and quick in the disobedience of Allah. You lived upon doubt, you died upon doubt, inshallah you'll be raised up upon doubt. So this is this right here. Number three, Al-Ikhlas. As Allah Ta'ala, He mentions in the Quran, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبَدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لِهُدِّينَ You have been commanded no more than this, to be worship Allah, مُخْلِسِينَ لِهُدِّينَ Sincere in your worship of Allah. So the right which is due to Allah is Al-Ikhlas. For the action to be accepted by Allah, it has to be sincerely done for Him. The opposite of, uh, of Al-Ikhlas is, as we know, Al-Riya, showing off. That the person he makes the act of worship for other than Allah, for the pleasure of the people rather than for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How the Prophet he described this as shirk al kufi, the hidden shirk, which is like a black ant on a dark zone on a moonless night. That's how dangerous this particular type of shirk is. And so the hadith of the Prophet, which is from the three hadith which are cover the whole of the Sharia nila. Innamal a'amalu bin niyat. Actions are by intentions, and you will have that which you intended. As the hadith narrated by Umar radiallahu an. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, he put this as the first hadith in his Jamia Sahih. First hadith. Why? He says, when you read this, read this with ikhlas. And for me, that I'm also, he said that as, a, as the author, that I have done this only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you don't, then you will be punished. The opposite of, like I said, al-ikhlas is giving the haq to Allah, al-riya is denying the haq. Next is as-sidq, as Allah Ta'ala He says, and that you will be tested, so Allah Ta'ala will test those people to find those people who are siddiq and those people who are kathab, true and those people who are false. So sidq, the more truthful we are, then Allah this affirms, the opposite of sidq as we know is nifaq, hypocrisy, that the person, he uh, says it on his tongue, but he does not believe it in his heart. This is Al-Nifaq. Then we have Al-Qubul. Okay, that the people, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, that, the, that we have to accept. We cannot reject 
The people, they'll say, we found our forefathers upon this way, that's why we do not. Then we have Al-Mahabba. And this is, as Allah says, that, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, there are people that who take for worship others beside Allah, and Dad besides Allah. They love them as they love Allah. But those people who believe are shadeed in their hub of Allah, in their love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the person has to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than the creation and everything else in it. The more, and, and this is the sign, love for Allah's sake and hatred for Allah's sake. And so the, this is the sweetness of Iman as the Prophet, the one who loves Allah and his messenger, okay, more than everything else. Next week, the, you know, uh, it's going to be a talk on the rights of the messenger and from the rights of the messenger is also to love the messenger, okay, before everything else. The opposite, as we know, of love is hate. So obviously this is why the love affirms. And finally, you have what we call al inqiyad uh, al compliance. That the person has to, the, from the, the right of Allah, is that you comply with the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you do not turn away from the hukum of Allah. As Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُكَ فِي مَا شَجْرَ بَيْنْهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِمْ هَرَجًا مِنْ مَقَدَيْتَ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا But no, by your Lord, you do not believe until you make the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the judge in your disputes. When his decision is given, you accept it with the fullest of submission. So these are the seven conditions of the, uh, of the Kalima. These are the seven conditions, as I said, when we affirm them, we fulfill the Haq of Allah, the right of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And when we deny them, or when we see the opposite of them, when we are denying the Haq of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And brothers, as I mentioned, you know, it is not enough just to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, this subject is, as you can see, such a big subject. And there's at least three or four more lessons to do, going through all of the different aspects of shirk and also the different categories of tawheed. Unfortunately, we haven't got time to go through all of that. But what I said at the beginning, as I said, brothers, the importance of the subject is, is, by, is judged by what the subject concerns. And because there is nothing more important than worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is why this subject requires greater emphasis in terms of our tarbiyah more than anything else. So that our foundation always remains firm upon this. So that regardless of whatever happens, we never make shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We make dua, Ya Allah, make us of those people who are judged by you as pure in our tawheed on Yawm al-Qiyamah, that we are granted the rewards of the purity of our kalima la ilaha illallah that we enter into paradise without any hisab aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfiru wa lakum wa lisa'ir al-muslimin fastaghfiru innahu huwa ghafur rahim okay brothers any questions or any comments or any other issues that you want to jazakallah khair for everyone's patience as well alhamdulillah you said about uh, uh, shirk uh, when you uh, allow yes There is major and minor shirk because, uh, okay, Allah Ta'ala does not forgive shirk al-akbar. Okay, so the shirk al-akbar, the major shirk, if you die upon this, then Allah Ta'ala will not forgive you. If you make tawbah for that shirk before you die, then obviously Allah has forgiven you. Regarding the minor shirk, this is the difference between shirk al-asghar and shirk al-akbar, minor and major. The one who makes shirk al-akbar, he has gone out of Islam. Some people, they say this is what we call kufr. Kalbi, this is the kufr of the heart, which means a person has accepted disbelief and has left Islam completely. If he's left Islam completely, then obviously, then the person, uh, you know, if that state will go to the hellfire abadan for eternity. The shirk al asghar means that the person has a weakness in the shirk, but this is not so great that the person goes out of Islam. But this is a major, this is like something which the person is sinful for, also cancels out the action. So for example, the, the, the hadith that I mentioned, the Prophet said, one who goes to the fortune teller, even though that the person hasn't believed in what that person has said, going to that fortune teller, okay, you, uh, is just going to that person is minor shirk. So what that means, you are sinful. For 40 days you pray, your prayer is not going to be accepted. So that's kind of like makes up for the sin. Your actions have become that. And then obviously on top of that, you have to ask Allah, forgive me for going to the fortune teller. You also have to seek repentance for this. So this is minus shirk. If the person went to the fortune teller 
and believed what the fortune teller says and believes that knowledge is superior than the knowledge that Allah Ta'ala has, the person has made shirk al-akbar. And so can you see that is why, that this is why the difference between minor and, and major. Yeah. It's a very good question, alhamdulillah. Uh, atheism is shirk because atheism is full negation, full denial of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore it is actually the worst type of shirk. Even the Hindus believe in God. And they, what they say is that all of the idols are avatars. They are intermediaries between ourselves and God. We go through them to get to God. So they still have a concept of tawheed, but again, like I said, it's mixed with shirk. So their belief is better than the belief of the atheist because the atheist, the communist, the person, they have completely denied and rejected the existence of Allah altogether. So this is shirk al-rububiyyah, a denial of the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is also shirk. Okay brothers, inshallah, if there's no more questions, jazakallahu khair. Wallahu alam subhanakum wa bihamdika, ashadu wa la ilaha la ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu alaykum wa salamun ala al-mursaneen, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.